also want to thank you for your prayers and support uh, as Tiffany has had baby one. And, and Nikki wanted to, uh, to speak to that a little bit. Good morning. Um, I want to personally thank you for all your prayers, your support, the food, the cards, especially uh, well, the love that you've shown towards us during this time of loss and of the baby. Um, it's been kind of a... Sorry? At first, you know, with my sister's husband passed away, it was very hard. So, folks understood. And I received texts, prayer, and uh, I would I said, you continue to pray for my sister and her sons. But then the birth of our grandson, after all that, that was also a, a rush. <laughs> you know, so I had to get from Phoenix to uh, Tucson. And the cops were very nice to bring me over here because I wanted to come. And they were so tired. And, couldn't drive me if they wanted to, but then they drove my nephew halfway to Casa Grande, and here I come. From that to this, and then, you know, we continue to be going, 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 but with prayer and your love and support, we've been able to make it through and just continue to pray for Tiffany and John and the baby, and us, of course. But I want to share a scripture with you guys. It's from 1 Thessalonians 5, 16. Through 18. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So we love you and continue to love you. <laughs> God gives and God takes away. And uh, Nikki does come from a very close family. There were ten children and they had two bedrooms. One, one belonged to the parents and the other one belonged to the slept in there like cordwood. Uh -huh. One next to another. So they were very, they're very close now. And we do, you know, uh, I would be remiss if, uh, if I didn't speak to you. You know, I called Arlene, I forget what day it was, where's Arlene, there's Arlene, to pray for the baby on, on the prayer chain. And the reason why I called is because he was very sick. We were very concerned. And, uh, I believe prayer is real. Prayer is alive. Amen. And uh, if I don't, if I don't, if I don't praise God for His answering of prayers, uh, then my prayers would end up falling away, null and void. Because uh, we need to, we need to recognize God in everything He does, whenever He does. It. So immediately after His putting His name on the prayer list, everything started to get better. He had, he had very severe jaundice. Do you know that jaundice is a contributor to deafness in infants? He had failed two, two hearing tests up to that point. But the very next hearing test, he passed his hearing test. And the jaundice has, is leaving his body. It's radiating up through his head or something. I'm not, I'm not sure how that all works. But, but we do. We want to thank you again for your prayer supports. And, and uh, that's really what the church family is about. We always need to be praying for each other. Uh, and if we don't, we're, we're just allowing ourselves to miss so much, really, of the benefit of, of, as a child of God. I just wanted to piggyback on a couple things that Mike mentioned. And again, thank you. We do have some extra postcards in the back. If you want to take a couple with you, you can take them to work with people that you know not that aren't in our mailing area and hand them to them. Or you can use them as a point of emphasis. And uh, additionally, I wanted to I wanted to emphasize next Sunday night's service. It's a service about our first love for Jesus. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna get up and teach and preach, even though you know that's hard for me, because I, I love to teach and preach. But we're gonna just talk and give testimony time to when. You came to know Jesus and anything you want to say about Jesus as we attempt to prepare our hearts for the upcoming revival, okay?
then I have one other announcement for Marsha. Marsha wants you to know that most of you know Barbara Lee. And we're trying to help Barbara Lee with her meals. And if you can help us help Barbara Lee with her meals on a Tuesday, on a Thursday, on a Saturday, or on a Sunday, if you would just coordinate that with Marsha. Marsha, raise your hand. That's Marsha. Right in the middle there. Just let Marsha know when you can help, and she'll give you all the details, okay? All right? Okay. So I think that's it for the, the announcements. And we... Oh, yes, Ashley? We have a baby shower at Marsha's house. For Amanda. For Amanda. Where's your... This is Amanda. That's Ashley. We'll hand out, we'll hand out programs later, so you know who they are.
But God, God set aside Israel so that He could reach us, the church, the Gentiles, and then so that He could ultimately reach His own people. And then we looked at the idea that uh, that he, he, uh, he, we looked at the idea of a premonition where God, uh, Paul warns us in his writings not to think that we as Gentiles are more holy than Israel, that we are more deserving as Israel. You know, Israel, Israel's sin is the same sins that we commit today. Israel's problems are the same problems we have today. We're all fortunate to be called by God's grace, just as Israel ultimately, ultimately will be. And then today, then, we're going to look at God's promise. Uh, we're going to look at his, how His temporary setting aside of Israel has an ultimate promise to it, okay? So open your Bibles with me to Romans 11. Romans 11. And we only have uh, two verses in our source text this morning. Romans 11, 23 and 24. Romans 11, 23 and 24. If you are mentally prepared to examine the Word of God and your heart is open to His teaching, would you uh, signify that by saying amen? amen? Amen. And would you please join me in standing out of respect for the magnificent truth, which is the Word of God. Romans 11. 23 and 24, and they also, if they do not continue in unbelief, will be grafted in, for God is able to graft them in. For if you were cut out of the olive tree, which is wild by nature, and were grafted contrary to nature into a cultivated olive tree, how much more will these, who are natural branches, be grafted into their own olive tree? Thank you. You can be seated. That's really small print. So, under this section, then, God's temporary setting aside of Israel, uh, God has a marvelous and very definite purpose for this setting aside. And all of the promises given in our, in our text, if you'll notice, the promise is given with a condition. See the condition? It says, if they do not continue in unbelief. That's the condition of the promise. But we already know that that condition will be fulfilled because God, long beforehand, assured His people that that condition would be met. And by that I simply mean that Israel will at last see Jesus as her Messiah. One day, Israel will repent of her unbelief and lament her rejection of, of Jesus. Zechariah 12.10 speaks out. It says, I will pour on the house of David and on the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Then they will look on me whom they pierced. Yes, they will mourn for him as one mourns for his only son and grieve for him as one grieves for a firstborn. And our, our text then states, in our source text it says, God is able to graft them again. Okay? That means God is able to bring back in the original branch that belongs to the plant and He will bring them back in. Now in the end times, the great tribulation, which we're studying on Sunday nights, the apostate Gentile church, which has, we read in our text, it says, this is a description of the apostate church, and if you don't know this, the apostate church is well and it's flourishing all around us today. Okay? All you got to do is look. All you have to do is read what people believe and you'll see that it's well and it's all around us today. But what it says in our text, it says, it has been cut off the olive tree which is wild by nature. That means that this church, these churches are wild by nature. They're not, they're not part of the original church and they're and then it says they are grafted contrary to the nature of a cultivated olive tree. And the cultivated olive tree is really a symbol of Israel and of God's people. So the idea is that the, the apostate church has become part of the church, but the apostate church eventually, will, we will see, will be cut off. 
during those times uh, itself it will be cut off. And at, at the time, at that time, Israel will return and it, 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 as it is reflected in the natural branches, and it will be grafted back into its own olive tree. And the olive tree then will function as the olive tree was meant to function. The descendants of Abraham will not only be physical descendants, they will also be spiritual descendants. So in regards to these thoughts, uh, I'd like to, to look at, as we, as we finish this little section, I'd like us to look at some Bible prophecy. Look, join me in Revelation 11. I'm going to be in Revelation 11, and then I'm going to correspond that with Zechariah, okay? Revelation 11 uh, is a very, very interesting prophecy. In Revelation 11, 1 through 4, it says, And then I was given a reed like a measuring rod, and the angel stood, saying, Rise and measure the temple of God. And when it says the temple of God, it really means the Holy of Holies the altar and those who worship there, but leave out the court which is outside the temple, that's the area uh, for, the, for the Gentiles, and do not measure it, for it has been given to the Gentiles, and they will tread the holy city underfoot for 42 months, and I will give power to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy 1,260 days clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the lampstand standing before the God of the earth. Okay? So, these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands standing before the God of the earth. What's that mean? Well, if you want to know what it means, you have to go find it. That's why one of the great things about the Bible, it is all interdependent, okay? It embellishes upon itself and explains itself to us. And to find that, we see in this vision, John is told, he's take, told to take a measuring rod, and he's supposed to measure the temple, the altar, and the worshipers, and that, that means that God is defining for us His own property. He lose His own property, His people, His chosen people. And He's commanding John to mark off uh, His divine possession for preservation. Because this is in the time of revelation, okay? This is where the people are perishing in, at a remarkable rate. So at the time, now remember when, when John is writing the book of Revelation, is there a temple? But the angel's telling him to measure the temple. Is that, is that an, uh, that, but, but that in itself is not an unusual thing because numerous prophets of the Old Testament note, note that there is a temple at the end times, that there is a temple. But this reference to a temple and in the end times is not unique, uh, these prophets would tell us. So during the time of the Great Tribulation, what that says is that the Jews will be converted and they will be marked off by God for His own protection. They will be marked off by God, and your outline, the first word is protection during the day of the Lord. Thus I believe, because of that, John's measuring of the temple seems to symbolize that the Jews will be, uh, that those people will be coming to salvation and kingdom blessings at a much greater frequency than the Gentiles might. The Revelation vision is very similar to Zechariah 2, 1 through 5, in which Israel is measured out by God for protection. He provides for them divine protection. He actually places a wall of fire around her, and uh, they, the nation Israel actually experiences the glory of God in their midst. Just as God's holy city was once measured to mark it out as God's possession, to be rebuilt in millennial glory, so the temple is measured to affirm that, that salvation will come for God's people, for the nation Israel. So, at this particular time, the Gentiles, as I've said, are left out. If you look at that second verse back in Revelation 11, most of them, why? Because most Gentiles at this time in history, during the end times, will be opposed to God's things. Okay? They will not be seeking God's things. They will, while some will still, still uh, receive Christ, uh, not as a whole people, as, as Israel will. And you'll, say, and you'll say, well, you're telling me every Jew will be saved? No, I'm telling you every Jew that God wants to be saved will be saved. Amen. Okay? Just as every Gentile that God wants to be saved will be saved, all right? If God has called you to be one of your, his children, you're going to, you're going to come to save your knowledge of him. All you have to do is exercise the faith and the belief to accept him. 
So the, uh, as we see here, we, we have these, these two lamp spans and two olive trees. And the identity of these two witnesses also speaks of Israel's uh, salvation. They're called the olive trees, the lamp spans. And that terminology comes all the way from Zechariah. And to properly understand what is being told to us in that end, end times prophecy, we need to go back to Zechariah's teaching. Okay? So uh, we're going to take a little excursion in the Old Testament, all right? Zechariah lived between the times of Ezra and Nehemiah, okay? He was a prophet, and the rebuilding of the temple had been approved in Ezra's time, but the temple had not yet begun to be rebuilt. And God decided, I'm going to use two men, I'm going to encourage them to start that restoration. And those two men are Joshua, the high priest, okay, and Jeroboam, Jeroboam, it has an L in the English, but it's not, it's uh, silent, it's Jeroboam, he's the governor of Jerusalem. And see, the Jews of that day understood one thing, and this is one thing we need to understand too, they knew that because of their sin, they really had no, they had no basis for which to seek God's favor. Because of the sin of the nation Israel, they had no basis to seek God's God's nation. That's much the way America finds itself today. Did you know that? How can God bless America when America blesses abortion? How can God bless America when America condones homosexual marriages? Amen. Somebody told me, you can't speak that way about homosexuality. I said, why not? God does. Amen. Does he not? Amen. Does he not consider it an abomination? Well, if God feels that way about it, guess what? He tells me how I'm supposed to feel. So that's the way I'm going to feel about it too. But that's the way that Israel found itself much the way we are today. And they knew that because of their faithless, evil hearts that God had forsaken them. But, and that's why they found themselves in captivity in the condition they were in. But the vision recorded in Zechariah 3 graciously promises a restoration to the people. Let me read that for, for you. It's from Zechariah 3, 1 through 10. It says, Then he showed Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord. And who's the angel of the Lord? Well, that's, that's Jesus. Watch. And Satan standing at his right hand to oppose him. And the Lord said to Satan, The angel of the Lord is the Lord. The Lord said to Satan, indicating his deity. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. This is not a branch plucked from the fire. Now Joshua was, was, it was clothed, it says, with filthy garments and was standing before the angel. Then he answered and spoke to those who stood before him, saying, Take away the filthy garments from him. And to him he said, See, I have removed your iniquity from you. A picture of them being clean, so I will clothe you with rich robes. And he said, Let them put on him a clean turban on his head. The high priest wore a turban, turban, and on the turban it said, The Lord is holy? Something like that. It had a direct, uh, direct wording in regards to the Lord. So it says they put a clean turban on his head, and they put the clothes on him, and the angel of the Lord stood by the coming branch. Then the angel of the Lord admonished Joshua, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, If you, if you will walk in my steps, and if you will keep my command, then you shall judge, then shall also judge my house, and likewise have courts, charge of my courts, and I will give you places to walk among those who stand here. He's talking about a reinstitution of the temple. Hear, O Joshua, the high priest, you and your companions who sit before you, for they are a wondrous sign, and behold, behold, he says, I am bringing my servant, the branch. Who's the branch? Branch. branch is Jesus Christ. We kind of we kind of we kind of shift the vision now from a contemporary time to a future time. For behold, the stone that I have laid before Joshua upon the stone are seven eyes. Behold, I will engrave its inscription. Says the Lord of hosts, I will remove the iniquity of the land in one day, and in that day, says the Lord of hosts, every woman invite his neighbor under his vine and under his fig tree. Okay, pointing towards the millennial kingdom. The high priest Joshua, who is the 
symbol of the nation Israel and the re representative of the people of God is cleansed, forgiven, and restored to act as God's agent in the restoration of the nation. And God has reiterated His promise of salvation in His covenant if the people would only do one thing, obey. That's all they need to do is obey. And when the people obey, restoration will come. And in those last few verses, as, as, as I said, we look forward to the Messiah, His kingdom, the great, ultimate, final, and glorious restoration of holiness and grace. See, God chose Joshua to stand before him as the cleansed and forgiven representative of Israel and a new temple to be built and a new Israel returned from captivity to its land and its God. That was just a taste, though. That's just a preamble. That's just a small preview of the ultimate salvation of Israel and the restoration that will be directed by Messiah at his second coming. Then, as we continue in Zechariah, we have presented for us a second key figure, Zerubbabel. And, and, Zerubbabel, and he says in 4, 1 through 3, Now the angel who talked with me came back and awakened me as the man who was awakened out of his sleep. And he said to me, What do you see? So I said, I am looking. And there's a lampstand of solid gold with a bowl on top of it. And on the stand, seven lamps with seven pipes to the seven lamps. Two olive trees are by it, one at the right of the, of the bowl and the other at its left. And then, so, we, they, so then, immediately we have a spontaneous, uh, we see an automatic provision from God when in verse 4, So I answered and spoke to the angel who talked to me, saying, What are these, my Lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. So he answered and he said to me, This is, this is the word of the Lord says that so that the Rebbe will know this is God who's speaking through me as his agent, not by, not by might, not by power, but my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. In other words, the vision you're receiving, you can, you can take it to the bank with you. This is the truth. And you know, the Holy Spirit alone has the power to restore Israel by his working in the, the nation's life. But the power will come, it says, through two olive trees. In verses 7 through 10 it says, Who are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel, you shall become a plain. That means, <coughs> who are, that means if you're an adversary who thinks you're a mountain, before, my, before this man you will be, he will knock you down to a plain. And he shall bring forth a capstone with shouts of grace. Grace to it. The capstone indicating the, the end of the building. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Jerubbabah have laid the foundation of this temple. His hands shall also finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? For these seven rejoice to see the plumb line in the hand of Jerubbabah. These are the, they are the eyes of the Lord. It talks about seven eyes. That means that there, his vision is complete. He sees everything, which scan to and fro throughout the whole earth. And as we saw earlier, along with Joshua, these two, these are the two great olive trees at this time in history that God will use to rebuild his temple. Okay? Together, one as a priest, the other as the governor of Jerusalem, they will be the human tools that the Holy Spirit will use to restore the nation. But there's one final component still here to God's plan, and that's in verses 11 through 14. Then I answered and said to him, what are these two olive trees at the right of the lampstand and at its left? And I further answered and said to him, What are these two olive branches that drip into the receptacles of the two gold pipes from which the golden oil drains? Then he answered me and said, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. And he said, These are the two anointed ones who stand beside the Lord of the whole earth. So God used these anointed ones to rebuild and restore ancient Israel, okay? Therefore, when we read Revelation, we see that God has two new witnesses that are olive trees and lampstands. So when we compare one set of Scripture with another set of Scripture, we see what? That they were both used in the exact same way. Because God uses the two witnesses to do what? To restore and rebuild His kingdom. God is... A, God. God is in the midst of renewal and restoration uh, with the two witnesses. At that time, though, they will restore a millennial 
temple, a new temple. The, the new work will be a, and the new work this time will be a national salvation. The new worship of the Lord Jesus Christ. So God used these tools in ancient times to restore Israel, the golden pipes through which the Holy Spirit flowed. In a similar way, in the New Testament, in Revelation 11, he uses the two witnesses who will be future instruments of Israel's salvation. You know, they're going to preach in Jerusalem, and they're going to be killed, and after three and a half days, what happens? Their bodies are risen up, okay? And what happens to the city of Jerusalem? It is brought to salvation because of the miracle of the restoration of the two witnesses. In, that, in, that, uh, in the New Testament there, it talks about uh, they gave glory to the God of heaven. That's the phrase used in Revelation that indicates salvation, okay? So the present destiny of Israel can and will be reversed. See, God set Israel aside for the last, how many years? For a definitive purpose. God has set Israel aside so that you and I could get saved, so that you and I could be humble. He set aside His chosen people and chose you. And so that he could, he could exhibit His glory and His grace to the entire world. But the return of Israel to the Lord is not only possible, the return of Israel to the Lord is certain. To be true to His own promise, God's chosen people cannot continue be forever in unbelief. Quoting from Isaiah 59, 20 and 21, Paul will declare in the, uh, in the next, next section of verses that we look at, in 26 and 27, he quotes from Isaiah and he says, All Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come out of Zion and he will turn away ungodliness from Jacob. For this is my covenant with them. When I take away their sins, when I take away their sins, they will be a holy people. And as a holy people, they will become acceptable to God. So what does all that mean to you today? What does that mean to you today? What that simply means to you today is that you need to consider... We need to consider that God, in His grace, in His glory, has set aside a time for us as Gentiles to come to be His children. Okay? He's placed, he's, there's a special time in history for us. Okay? And this time has been set aside for us to be called to Him. But if we allow that time to pass, there will be a time, I'm sorry to say, when there will not be another one called to salvation. So the immediacy, how's the world doing right now? How are, how's the news? Do you watch the news? And it's tough to watch the news for more about 10 minutes. Uh, let's see. Syria, the, the new Islam caliphate. Do you, remember, do you know what a caliphate is? We are now... We have returned history about 800 years. We've gone back in history about 800 years. We now have a, an Islamic caliphate in the, in the Middle East. You know what a caliphate is? It's an Islamic kingdom which is, which is dedicated to one thing, the spread of Islam. You know how Islam is spread? As they conquer new people, right now they are kicking all the Christians out of northern Iraq. Some of the Christians in northern Iraq have been there 2,000 years. They're kicking the Christians out. They're destroy, destroying their churches. And they're telling the Christians, you can do one of three things. You can move. You can pay our, our very onerous tax. Or if you stay, we'll kill you. That's a conversion program. <laughs> well, that's what it is. That's their conversion program. We now have a new kingdom, a new country in the Middle East that's dedicated to that. That's their agenda. Syria, uh, they've just taken over that same caliphate. They've now just taken over one of the largest cities in northern Syria. Uh, Libya, we've evacuated our embassy. Uh, where else are we? Where, where else? Oh, well, Israel, Gaza. The world is falling apart. You know why? Because there's no influence of good. The influence, the real influence for good in the world has decided we're not going to influence the world anymore. We're going to 
step back from the world stage. So, hey, you, you only, you, you only, you're only going to reap what you sow. And that's what we've done. But in the specific today, see, what God is doing today is He is calling a people that are ready to help fight this battle of the end time. He's calling people that are founded and grounded in God's Word, and He's asking them to come forward and be His child and allow Him to work through them to further His kingdom. And this is the kingdom that will only matter in the end. But there's a lot of work to be done. So, uh, Doug and the Praise and Worship team, the lady's going to come up. And if you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I'm not sure what you're waiting for. Because, uh, as I said, there will be a time when there will be no more call. And we need to be about God's business. We need to be prepared spiritually, emotionally, even in, even in some ways physically, for the upcoming battle that's before us. So Doug and the, the girls are going to lead us in a song of invitation. As they do that, if the Lord moves upon your heart, don't, don't be bashful. Everybody, it happens. God calls, it's back, it's okay to get up and come forward, and uh, but let's give, let's give the Lord this time as we, as we go to Him in prayer, and if you'll join me in standing, if you'll, uh, if you go ahead and bow your head and close your eyes, and uh, I'll lead us in a time of prayer, reflection, and invitation. Father, we, we thank you, Lord, for allowing us this, uh, this opportunity to come before you this morning, and Lord, uh, we thank you for your word, which uh, shows us uh, in the, in the, uh, how in a period of several thousand years, you illuminate one truth with another truth. And Father, uh, we just thank you that we have your word before us, that we can see all of this revealed to us, how you have uh, taken the mystery out of some of the mysteries and revealed them to us. And Father, as we come to this time of invitation, it's our desire, Lord, that uh, our words not be important. Our, uh, we just give this time to you. And we pray, Lord, that this would be a time where your spirit would sweep among us. And Lord, uh, whatever the need might be, might it be, uh, if it's for salvation, we'll rejoice over your action, not our actions. We'll rejoice over your calling in someone's life. If it's uh, someone for membership, someone for baptism, someone for prayer time, Lord, someone that needs to kneel out at the altar and lay their burden before you. Whatever the need, Lord, we give, we give this time to you now, Lord. And we just, we just thank you for your calling on our lives. And we look forward to what you will do, Lord, as, as, the, as the world becomes ever more evil. It gives us ever more opportunity to do good. So we thank you, Lord, for that chance. May we be, may we be up to the task at hand. We pray, pray this all in